Yeah, 40 years are spent on oil rigs. And I mean, it does beg the question, what would you necessarily know about the oil industry? 40 years on an oil rig, it's, you know, it's not in itself, uh, 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 you know, it's not in itself uh, a qualification, but it, it does give me a, a different sort of view of the oil industry. It's the, the oil industry for me, of course, is absolutely and utterly concrete. It's where I've spent most of my life. I, I know it very well. The, the nuts and bolts, you know, the, the rigs, the, the men, the, the way it works. Um, and why that's important, I think, is because um, since I've become involved with the climate justice movement, I mean, inspired by Extinction Rebellion, I mean, one of the, the issues that has constantly been there for me is that the, the oil industry, it, it has been viewed to a large extent, for, for a large part of that time, it was viewed as a sort of concept. I mean, it, it was understood that fossil fuels are uh, at the root of the, the climate crisis. And of course, um, the climate crisis, although this meeting is about, is about uh, the cost of living crisis in the North Sea, I mean, we're not <laughs> talking about the climate crisis. We're really not putting anything into its context today. We're not really talking about the real world. And, and the, you know, the fossil fuels are, a, it's, a, it's a concept, it's, it's rather abstract. I mean, where we need to get the conversation. And I think Juan will know this, he took the, the Scottish climate camp up to Aberdeen. Where we need to put the conversation is firmly into the, 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 the real world. And that's the world where North Sea gas is uh, driving a, a crisis of the cost of living crisis and threatening to destroy lives. It's a destroying lives already. And um, so, um, I mean, I, I mentioned the climate crisis, but as I say, because you, you can't avoid it. It, it. Otherwise, nothing makes much sense. And the, I mean, the short version is that, that if we keep drilling for oil and gas, then and keep burning it, then we really are sunk. Um, I don't think there's, I, I don't know who the audience is here today, but I don't think there's going to be much uh, uh, disagreement with that. And if there is, it can be raised in the discussion. The, <clears throat> the, the North Sea, the, the plan, the oil company plan for the North Sea is, has got a name. It's called uh, Maximize Economic Recovery, and it is pretty much as it says. It's, it's about taking every single drop of hydrocarbons out of the North Sea. It's, uh, it's written into law, and it's existed since way before COP. I mean, it, it, COP was slightly surreal. They, they, they talked about uh, uh, cutting emissions, and, and yet it was done with, a, with this policy in place. And you can be assured that if maximizing economic recovery of hydrocarbons is the policy on the North Sea, then it's the policy of the oil industry everywhere. So since we, we, we uh, proposed the meeting, there have been a couple of changes. I mean, there are, are, are a couple of new things have happened. I mean, obviously, firstly, the, uh, the election of, of Liz Truss, and, and uh, she has come out and uh, confirmed the enormity of the cost of living crisis in a pretty spectacular fashion by, by throwing, well, we don't know how much, but somewhere in the region of 130 billion pounds at this problem. Uh, money she's going to borrow in her name and, and make us pay back, presumably. Uh, the, the, her fantasy, the fantasy is that she's going to grow the economy to pay for this. But the, the madness is that she thinks that uh, she's going to do this by being cheerleader for the oil and gas industry and, and ramping up gas and oil production, despite the fact that there is absolutely no way, no proof and no way that uh, th th this can be done quickly, that even if it is done, that it will affect the cost of living, that you can reduce the prices. Um, my, my own opinion is that eventually they will try to make the people pay. In a sense, we have a, a, a hiatus here. We have a, a slight pause. I mean, if we, if we uh, look at the, the plan, the plan was that uh, there was going to be another hike in the cap 
the, the uh, limit on the, the bills that people pay for energy and that, uh, and that uh, oh, I've lost my place here. Anyway, um, this obviously is not going to be some sort of definitive analysis of the cost of living crisis, but it, it is going to start by responding to a couple of the big lies that are that have been uh, pushed around in this in this last period, and I mean, it, households are facing a steep increase in their energy prices due to supply and demand on the global wholesale market, and this has driven up the amount providers pay for gas and electricity, and that cost is now being passed on to the consumer. Well, I took that quote from a BBC web page, and there may well be uh, such thing as a global wholesale market for energy, but this in no way explains why there have been huge increases in energy bills for consumers in the UK. There is no global market uh, that North Sea gas could realistically be part of. Um, North, you know, there are no pipelines anywhere else other than Europe. Well, there are pipelines to Kazakhstan, that is true. Uh, but, but the gas, you know, the pipeline from Kazakhstan is full of gas coming the other way. Kazakhstan does not need North Sea gas. Um, the, you, you can't liquefy North Sea gas and, and send it around the world. I mean, we don't have the facilities to do this, and we don't have the fleet of tankers to send it. So uh, even if there were desperate potential gas buyers in India and China, uh, assuming that they exist, they can't get hold of North Sea gas. They can't bid the price up that we are being paced, forced to pay for this. It's just not possible. There is not a market in the way that most of us think of markets. You know, somebody comes to a table in a square and takes seven apples and eight people turn up and you think, oh, the price of apples is going to be high today and somebody's not going to get an apple. It, it's not like that. The, the other big lie is that the, the, the root of this crisis is purely down to the, the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Well, you know, the, the prices began to rise, wholesale gas prices began to rise way, way before the, the, the war in, in, in Ukraine. And the majority of our gas, something around 90% of the, the domestic gas, the gas we, that we use in this country comes from the North Sea. That's from the British and the Norwegian sectors. Um, I mean, there is no difference between the British and the Norwegian sector. I mean, there is an imaginary line between them, but it's the same gas coming from the same, the same geographical entity and with roughly the same cost of production. And, and there has been no significant cost of production uh, increase in, in, in gas production from the North Sea. I, I, by chance, I happen to know uh, Professor Alex Kemp, who used to drink in the same pub in Aberdeen many years ago, and he's the, he's the man who, who wrote the official history of uh, North, the North Sea gas industry. And, you know, he's confirmed this, that there, there, there has been no significant increase in the cost of gas production. So there, there we have, you know, that, that's not an analysis of the situation. I can't explain the gas markets. They're, 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 they're very, very complicated. Uh, they do include uh, hedge fund speculators, and my guess is that they are part of the reason. But we don't really have to look very far before we see one of the major reasons for, for uh, the, the cost of living crisis dr driven by gas. The big four North Sea gas producers, Total, Shell, BP and Equinor, they made £74 billion in profits between them in the first half of this year. And, and although, you know, all, these profits were all generated by, by North Sea gas, it's, it's not coincidental that, that, that this is happening. Yeah. Profiteering is, lies at the root of the, the cost of living crisis, crisis. So 
I mean, I think the £130 billion pounds or whatever it turns out to be that the, the government is borrowing on our behalf gives a, a pretty clear idea of the size of the threat that we're living under. Uh, it's a sum of money that was going to be extracted from the population through periodic hikes in the retail price caps that started way back in 2021 and was meant to be ramped up considerably in October. Well, they've scrapped that. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of, of the, the various uh, increases in the cap. Everybody here, well, if, if we, can, we can talk about them later. But, I mean, the effects are, 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 are startlingly clear. I mean, the economies of the poorest and the most vulnerable, those with special needs, uh, they, they're stretched to the limits by the price hikes that have already taken place. And, and they would have been completely and utterly wrecked had this October price rise gone ahead. I mean, trust was utterly silent during our campaign. And it was, it was you know, it, it, it became very clear that she had absolutely no uh, reason or, or uh, intention of, of uh, dealing with this. But obviously, reality or sense has prevailed. I mean, there was a huge outcry from the energy providers who said, well, people are not going to pay. People can't pay. And the people who can are not going to pay. It's just not going to happen. So I, I think that the trust decision to, to freeze the bills, they, they think, for the next two years, is, uh, although £130 billion doesn't quite explain that, it cost them £35 billion to provide something like 80% relief with the Johnson government. £130 billion does not freeze the prices for two years on that mathematics. But I think everybody is very clear that they can't, they're not in a position where they can lumber the people with these massive costs, this massive cost of living uh, increase. But there's nothing sure of, somebody has to pay for it. And the likelihood is that it's going to be us. Um, I, I wanted to go to, the, I'm looking at the time. How am I doing? Anyway, um, I wanted to go. That there's one particular part of the community where I live on the south side of Glasgow that are, are really facing a perfect storm at the moment. Um, it embodies really all the various parts of the equation that I've kind of haltingly tried to spell out sketchily. And I think that the, it's worth taking a look at the situation. I mean, these people are, are people of Pakistani heritage living in, in Govan Hill and Pollock Shields. And they've been watching as their families, friends and erstwhile neighbors and about a third of the districts and 12% of the land surface of Pakistan have been devastated by floods, which even the government of Pakistan recognizes are a, a direct result of global warming, uh, driving by, driven by fossil fuel burning. So, I mean, while trying to raise aid for the victims in Pakistan, this part of our community are facing their own fossil fuel induced crisis. The, the, their cost of living is, has shot up recently. It's driven by the very same uh, fossil fuel fuels that are driving the, the global warming. This, this is a, a confluence of, of you know, the, the general crisis of, of, of uh, uh, global warming and the particular circumstances in the UK where our particular fossil fuel, North Sea gas, is driving a cost of living, which, which these people cannot afford. And, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the situation here where we are facing a, a major, major struggle. And I'm looking at who in society has risen to the struggle so far. And it has got to be said that the, the climate justice movement, uh, Extinction Rebellion, uh, Just Stop Oil, uh, Climate Camp Scotland, uh, the, 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 the uh, Stop Cambo. Here, we, we've, we've seen uh, the methods of, of, of non-violent, 
direct action. Uh, the, the, these energetic, in the main, young people have brought the struggles onto the street in front of everyone. And my, my own feeling is that if we are going to, uh, okay, thanks. <clears throat> if we are going to confront the, the cost of living crisis, it's, it's at once an enormous challenge, but it's also an enormous opportunity. When I look at the, 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 the Pakistani community, I wonder why the, the climate justice movement has not rallied to the, to the cause of the people of Pakistan and supported the local communities here to, to publicize and to, uh, you know, to develop the arguments to demand of the British government that they take their responsibilities seriously and to begin to think about how we can, we can begin to um, intervene and support uh, local communities who are going to be faced with enormous challenges. I think the challenges that they're going to be facing, well, they already are facing. The challenges are to stay warm in the winter and to stay fed when there's a huge um, ask on your diminishing resources. So, I mean, okay, one minute. Um, I, I, th I think that's really basically all that, that, that I want to say. I know that's all been a bit disjo disjointed, but uh, I think that there are major questions raised about the cost of living crisis and how we confront it. And I think that the climate justice movement must see itself absolutely firmly at the center of that. And of course, this is a public meeting and not a, a lecture. So, you know, it's, it's from this point that I'm hoping that we'll see some discussion on these issues. Anyway, thanks for giving me your time.